This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. I'm grateful to have, have the opportunity to appear, to appear on this program with all of the great, great gospel preachers that will be appearing. You know, it seems to me that two of the great problems that face the church today is the fact that so many are ignorant about the teaching of the Bible and so many people are indifferent as to what it says anyhow. Since the church is composed of fallible human beings, it's always had problems and always will. Two men were discussing the greatest problem facing the church today, and one said it was ignorance of the Word of God, while the other insisted that it's, it was religious indifference. Turning to a friend who was standing by, they asked him what he thought. He replied, I don't know and I don't care. Ignorance does not mean stu stupidity or inability to learn. <clears throat> a professor with a PhD degree may be a genius in his field, but densely ignorant concerning biblical doctrine, never having examined the evidence for the divine inspiration of the Bible. Ignorance and indifference are deadly sins leading to eternal perdition. Those who forget God are told in Psalm 9, 17, that the wicked will be turned into hell with all the nations that forget God. Hosea spoke of God's people being destroyed because of lack of knowledge of the will of God. You know, indifference is an ancient problem. 600 years before Christ, Jeremiah sat weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, and he was faced by a nation that apparently didn't seem to care. The Chaldean army had destroyed the city and captured and carried away thousands of the Jews into captivity into Babylon. But many of the people who had been left behind in Judea were totally unconcerned with the fate of the holy city. They were indifferent toward the ruins of their temple and ceased to worship their God. Jeremiah said the ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feast and all the gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgin reflected, and she is in bitterness. Lamentation 1 and verse 4. Again, the prophet says, How lonely sits the city, city that was full of people. How like a widow is she who, who was great among the nations, the princess among the proverbs, uh, princess among the pr provinces. Lamentation 1 and verse 1. They should have been busy rebuilding the walls, restoring the temple, and worshiping their God. But the people had rejected God, and he ceased to be a wall of fire protecting Jerusalem. Her glory had departed, and the city lies in ruins. The tragedy lies not so much in the broken walls the stolen treasures, the desecrated temple, and the captives in Babylon, but in their in, indifference toward the worship of God. We live in a generation where many of our leaders are unconcerned, no longer care about honesty and character and responsibility toward God. Our president is charged with adultery, lying before grand jury, and deceiving the nation. Yet to many it doesn't matter just so the economy is thriving. What happens to the righteous 
when the foundations are destroyed. Psalms 11, verse 3, David raised that question. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Nations that cease to care about morality will soon cease to exist. Think, think about the great empires of the past that have fallen. In most all of the cases, moral conditions deteriorated to the point that the countries could no longer continue. They were taken over by the enemies and they, they fell because of corruption from within. You know, one of the problems that we have today is that liberals demand license. They talk about liberty, but really what they want is something free from all restrictions imposed by law. They don't want to feel guilty because they violated some law or moral code in the Bible, and so they tell us the Bible consists of love letters, not laws. Salvation is holy by grace, they say, apart from any human activity or response on our part. The change ages among us seem determined to change eternal principles by contending for a new hermeneutic. This will allow them to change the meaning of words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They would have us believe there is no distinctive pattern in the Holy Scriptures that we are obligated to follow. Some are saying we must accept fellowship with everyone who calls himself or calls upon God as his Father. They seek open fellowship with a pious unmersed. They tell us the church is doomed unless we conform to the world and to the present culture. They continue to cry, give us liberty, but that's not what they want. They want license to do as they please. And so they reject all law, really, and call for license to do whatever they want to do in worship and in service to God. Judge Robert Bork once was considered, considered for appointment in the Supreme Court. He's written a book titled Slouching Toward Gomorra, dealing with the present decline in morality in America. He attributes the decline in morality to the modern influence of modern liberalism. In, in commenting on President Clinton's shameful behavior, he said 30 years ago Clinton's behavior would have been absolutely, absolutely disqualifying. Yet it doesn't appear to affect Clinton's popularity. It's difficult not to conclude that our moral perceptions and reactions have changed profoundly. If that change is permanent, the implications for our future is very bleak. He further asserts in his book that the themes of liberty and equality in our Constitution have been pressed much too far and account for the cultural devastation wrought by modern liberalism. He claims that the agenda of modern liberalism is being advanced by the judiciary headed by the Supreme Court. Our modern unqualified enthusiasm for liberty forgets that liberty can only be the space between the walls, the walls of morality and the liberty based on morality. It's sensible to argue how far apart the wall should be, but it's cultural suicide 
to demand all space and no walls. Our concern this morning is for the church of our Lord. We've considered Jeremiah's mournful plea on behalf of Jerusalem and a nation that ceased to worship God. He loved the city with its temple, once filled with worshipers, but now desecrated and deserted by the people. Looking on the ravaged and ruined city, we can understand this sorrowful quick question. Is, is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Lamentations 1 and verse 12. Je Jesus loved the city of Jerusalem and longed to save those people in that city, but they refused his plea. Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth his chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus came to his own people, but they received him not. How tragic that situation it was. However, our love and concern today is for the Lord's church and for the heavenly Jerusalem, where our loved ones shall greet us in that heavenly city that God has prepared for the faithful. Our love is focused on Christ, who died for us on the cross of Calvary, and the church which he purchased with his blood. Matthew, Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus shed bitter tears over the fate of Jer Jerusalem, but he died for the church. When I think of the church, think of Jesus, and the terrible price he paid for our redemption. I'm tempted to ask the same question that Jeremiah asked. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? If the church should fail, power over the world would be lost. The great influence for honesty and character and virtue would be lost. Sin would reign supreme and Satan would be in control. How can anyone be indifferent toward the Lord who died for him? God's faithful people constitute the church today. Our buildings are but convenient places to assemble for worship. If we build elaborate buildings to satisfy our pride and compete with the world, and lose the people, we've lost the church. I marveled at the great temples in London, but was told that few people ever meet to worship God in these buildings anymore. We built some large and expensive buildings to conform to the culture, but the soul-saving gospel, I'm told, is seldom preached in some of these churches. Have the elders no longer had any concern or care? If not, why are false brethren invited to occupy the pulpit, entertain the audience, and put on a show, and draw the crowds and in and, and so doing, promote their errors. Why are these men applauded when they ridicule the church and criticize preaching being done 50 years ago when the church was enjoying its greatest growth? 
Why do elders sit silent and nod their heads when the flock is being fed a diet of Calvinism or Neo-Pentecostalism? Some of our pseudo-scholars receive their training under infidel professors in a denominational seminary and were too weak to resist modern liberalistic doctrines. Strong, informed elders could have solved many of our prob problems before the churches were divided and troubled over these issues. God requires elders to feed, feed and protect the flock, Acts 28, 28 to 31. God will hold the elders accountable as guardians of the flock. And when Christ the chief shepherd shall appear, the faithful elders that have guarded the flock will receive a crown of glory which fades not away. You know, indifference is something about it sounds like that it operates like creeping paralysis. It's slow in its development. I'm persuaded that the greatest foe to the church today is not opposition from without, but soul chilling different from within. It's not a change in attitude that comes overnight. I'm told that a frog placed in a basin of water in an experimental lab, and the water's heated at 3,600 degrees per second, the frog dies when it reaches 140 degrees, but that he's never aware of the change in temperature. The husband who truly loves his wife doesn't turn from fervent love to complete difference overnight. I'm sure that the church in Ephesus did not cease to love the Lord in 24 hours. Yet Jesus rebuked them, saying, Yet I have this against you, that you no longer love me as you did at first. That quotation is from Weymouth's translation. Of the seven churches of Asia, Laodicea was lukewarm. Sardis was dead. Ephesus had lost her first love, and all three of them needed to repent. But if you want to kill the church, you don't need to shoot the preacher and hang the elders and burn the building down. Just leave it alone. Ignore it and let it die a natural death. What, what has happened in the church today? Having considered the tragedy of religious indifference, the loss of love for Christ, the loss of respect for biblical authority, and the decline in morality, to, to what else would you attribute our problems. It seems to me that our weakness lies in powerless and pointless preaching and compromise with denominational bodies. If the church and the gospel are no longer distinctive, we've lost our right to exist in this world. But how can we reverse this trend? and see the church grow again as it did back when it was the fastest growing body in the South. We can preach the gospel without fear or favor. We can defend the perfect law of liberty by which we'll all be judged, James 2 and verse 12. For we're not without law as a liberal element keeps telling us, this is a false assumption. We have the perfect law of liberty in Christ, 
James 1.25. And we're going to be judged by the law that controls deals with our actions and with our life, with our char character, and with those things that we hold to be right. You know, Judge Bork in his book was right in many things that he said. America has adopted a policy that will lead us into the moral filth, perversion, and depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah, the evil cities of the plain which God destroyed with fire. Some major companies are sponsoring programs filled with filth and violence, premarital sex, and they're leading our children down a moral sewer headed for Sodom. If you want to know what it's going to be like when we reach this point, read Romans 1, verses 21 through verse 32. And it describes what life was like in the city of Sodom. We have a strong battle to fight. We've got many difficulties before, before us. Some are deserted. Some have died to faith. But we know that the sword of the Spirit is powerful, and we can finally win the victory, and the church can survive. We've got to get back to plain biblical preaching. We've got to get back and deal with some of the assertions that these fellows are making about the authority of the scriptures, the validity of the miracles that were wrought in New Testament times, the evidence for the divinity of Christ, and deal with, with those things that have to do with the fundamental basis of our faith. I believe if I were meeting an infidel in debate, I'd be willing to base everything on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Think of all the different ones that saw him after he was raised up from the dead. The women, the apostles, the disciples different, on different occasions. Over 500 brethren, Paul said, saw him at one time. And so I would be willing to base it on the resurrection of up from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, he's not just a mere, mere, mere man. He was divine. He was the Son of God. And he quoted the Old Testament and approved it, so it's right. The New Testament is his message to man today. And that would have to be accepted. And so the whole question of authority and divinity could be proven by basing it on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Some poet said, all ye that pass by to the, sa to the Savior draw nigh, to you is it nothing that Je Jesus should die? For sin not his own, he died to atone, was pain and sorrow like his ever known. How can anyone be indifferent to the one who died for us? Let's enter the battle with the sword of the Spirit, begin preaching the gospel in its fullness, and meet the tide of opposition and defeat them with the sword of the Spirit and restore the old time gospel and the, and the old time teachings of the book that we can stand on and fight our battles and be sure the foundation will always remain sure and steadfast. I thank you for the opportunity I trust that these remarks may be helpful to you 
in some way. Thank you. This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory.